much for the love. Holy smokes, we are ready to record and get through our first ever episode of A Hoops Journey. If we are being totally honest, we are absolutely blown away with uh, the reception from everyone. Thank you for the follows, the likes, the comments, the texts after our uh, first little intro podcast. And uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and we hope that you continue to spread the love and let people know. We think that uh, we have a good platform and a good opportunity to spread uh, people's stories and their journeys. So stick with us and uh, we're excited about where this goes. But we really wanted to start off today with, with, with a big thank you to you all. And yeah, we didn't really expect it to go this quick, but uh, thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to attempt our first ever mailbag portion of the podcast here. Thank you to, we have a couple people who actually emailed us at hoopsjourney at gmail.com. They sent us some questions. Feel free to uh, message us on Instagram as well. And we will try to get to as many questions as we can. These are actually pretty fun and we'd really appreciate it if you sent us as many as possible. The first part that we're going to talk about is from a former player of mine, played at St. Thomas More. Jalen Janna, heck of a point guard, amazing football player, went on to play post-secondary football and just actually graduated with his degree from uh, Carleton University. So props to him. Way to go, Jay. Appreciate the questions and dialing us up. One of the things he asked us about five things, but in the email wasn't really a question, was he, he wanted me to mention some of the greatest players that I've seen or that I've coached or coached against or played against. So we thought that would be a fun one to answer. So thanks for the question. Uh, Some of the greatest players that I had the opportunity to play with, I go back to high school uh, when I was in grade 11, Dave Morgan, grade 12, 6'11". Honestly, no bias feel like he might be one of the most underrated high school players of all time. He was a first team all-star two years in a row as grade 11 and 12, won two provincial championships, could defend, could shoot the three kind of before anybody else in that, that era in like 1994, 95, 93 you know, could really step out and shoot it at that height. Uh, he was a fierce competitor, uh, went on and actually played professional lacrosse for a bunch of years. But his his basketball journey was he played two years of JUCO in Utah, and then he played two years of Division One at the University of Nevada in uh, Reno. And he was just an unbelievable player, unbelievable competitor. He's literally the reason we won. He was just so tough. When we were in grade, when I when I was in grade eleven, he was grade twelve when we won. Eric Heinrichson was the MVP. Hoping to find him and track him down and get him on this podcast, but uh, I think that was a reason that he was overlooked. Was that you know he wasn't the MVP, but that doesn't really say a lot. Um, just because he weren't the MVP, uh, he ended up playing you know junior national team and he had a great pro career overseas. So. For sure, he's at one of the top of my lists. One of the guys as well would be Jordy McTavish. Jordy McTavish was a point guard out of Salmon Arm. Had a lot of pressure coming in as a young kid. Uh, they touted him as the next Steve Nash, which was a lot to take on. But he ended up going to the University of Utah, and he actually was the backup point guard behind Andre Miller. Uh, for those of you that know who Andre Miller is, unfortunately for Jordy, he ended up tearing his knee, either the same knee twice or or a different knee. Um, He played on the national team, uh, had a great career, and was a heck of a player. And for sure, he was one of the most talented guys that I had the opportunity to play with. And I think lastly would be Randy Nora. Randy, for those that don't know who Randy Nora is, you know, he came out of Aldergrove, an undersized, stocky point guard. But just um, when his athleticism wasn't able to win games and, you know, his quickness, he was able to get that with his mind. And Randy and I played from the BC Summer Games, which would have been like U14 or 13, something like that, to provincial teams every year. Uh, we won a national championship together at Langara. And the irony is that the year that I was at Brandon, my last year of eligibility, we lost to St. of X and he was on that team. So also another guy, I'm, um, you know, I've got a target on to get on this podcast. Players that I played against, uh, for sure, in high school, Andrew Mavis. Mave was... Uh, we played at Richmond High. We had the fortune of of winning. We couldn't do nothing. Dave Morgan. He he could move. He was six five, six six. Was smooth. Could dunk on people. Could shoot it. Um, and became a real deadly shooter from the perimeter. He was on the two thousand 
Olympic team that made the Sydney Olympics along with Eric Heinrichsen as well, which is crazy. I was talking with someone the other day that the final four, when I was in high school, like in grade 11, the semifinal, we played a future Olympian. And in the final, we played a future Olympian, like just bananas to think about the talented guys. But Maeve went on. He also went to play Juco in Utah. Um, and then he went to Northern Arizona and played pro and just, you know, an unbelievable player and honestly, just an amazing human being. Uh, talked about Eric Heinrichsen as well. Just an absolute beast, an undersized post, which has a soft spot for me in my heart because kind of that's what I was. Played at UVic, was National Player of the Year, all Canadian, won a national championship and ended up being on the national team as well. And just in high school, like I think he averaged 20 plus rebounds a game in the provincials and he was the MVP as the third place team. So, you know, you're a baller when that happens. When I was in the U17 provincial team, Jay, I'm um, talking to you because you're the one who asked the question. Uh, we played a state team from Seattle and they had Jason Terry and Michael Dickerson on the same team. Now, if you know, give those guys a Google, but uh, the Jet, Jason Terry played at Arizona was a heck of a player. So did Michael Dickerson, actually. He played for the Grizzlies. Uh, both had great NBA careers. Uh, we went down there and played them, and we lost by, like, 55. It was bananas. They went off the backboard and dunked on us, and um, it was it was pretty nutty. Uh, as a coach, some of the best players that I've coached against would be uh, or coached for. On my first year out of high school, I coached Rob Sacre, who was out of Hansworth. He was a year young but played on the U17 team. Went on to Gonzaga, played for the Lakers. You know, if you make the NBA, you're obviously doing something right. Big Rob was an absolute pleasure. And it was just different coaching him because when we would go to games, we we didn't just have moms and dads in the crowd. We had like legit coaches. Like I remember looking over and seeing like Rick Patino and different people. I was like, okay, so he's on people's radars. Uh, seven feet and did well for himself. So shout out to Big Robbie. Coached the U15 team. I was trying to think about what year it was, Corbs. So your year, U fifty. So you would have been like twenty ten, probably right, grade ten. Yeah. So twenty ten. Dwayne yeah. Notice. Dwayne Notice was on the team from Ontario. Uh, he played for South Carolina a couple of years ago. That made the final four. They made a crazy push. He was just a man amongst boys at that level. It was like they were kids, and he just dominated as well. That same summer that I coached Sac Ray. Chris Joseph played for Quebec. He went on to play at Syracuse Division One, and he ended up getting drafted by the Celtics. Didn't hang on with the Celtics, but did play overseas for a bunch. And by far the best player that I've seen when I was coaching a game was that summer when I coached that U17 team with Goulet and Scott Allen. I'll save the Goulet stories as we move on. Don't worry about that. I got plenty of those. That's, that's my guy. But uh, we ate in some little gym some rural place it, just outside of Seattle. We played against Isaiah Thomas. They had like blue reversibles. It was him and a bunch of white dudes. He absolutely dominated us. It was crazy to watch this guy play. Never would have expected, you know, going to Washington and then having the career that he did. Obviously injuries have hurt him the last few years. When, when we were coaching, it was just one of those, there's nothing we can do to actually stop this guy. So those are probably my top guys. Uh, guys that I got the opportunity to see but didn't play or coach against when I was in high school, for sure. I got to see Stefan Marbury and a guy by the name of Felipe Lopez, who uh, was the front page of Sports Illustrated, went to St. John's, um, played for the Grizzlies as well, um, but career just didn't pan out like they thought it would. But they they touted him as one of the next the next Jordans. You know, just been blessed to be around the game and see enough of those players. And those are just ones at the top of my head. No disrespect to anyone, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into 38 years of basketball. You just you get to see enough people. So, Andrew Mavis was on that team with uh, on the 2000 team with Nash, yeah, right? Yes, sir. Same with Heinrichsen. Yep. Right. Oh, I got Todd you. McCullough and Sean Swords and uh, Rowan Barrett, AJ Barrett's dad. Like, yeah, yep. that was a that was a fun run because you know that was a time in my life where I was actually tuned into that, and that was a you know, peaking basketball wise. And it was awesome to watch them qualify and make it. It was an emotional time for a lot of people and love to see us get back there. I know many of us have tough memories of our getting ousted a few years ago and not qualifying. So we won't talk about that, will we, Corbs? Shout out Mike <laughs> Chung. The next question that we thought would be cool to discuss, and Corbin's going to jump in a bit here, is the Kobe question. And do we undervalue the debate with him and LeBron and MJ just being like, 
Izzy and the goat conversation. And maybe upon reflection, the first kind of trailer pod we did, I don't want to get into a lot of goat talk. I feel like sometimes we spend a lot of time maybe just not appreciating what we're seeing and we're always comparing. Um, and I think we should let these guys just finish it out before we compare. You know, Corbs, you can talk to that. That's a guy that, you know, you were like a kid watching Kobe grow up. And so what are your thoughts? Where do you see him in that in the mix there? And do we overlook him or is he kind of placed where it's appropriate? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really get a chance to watch, you know, Jordan back when I was a kid, right? I was four years old when he retired from the Bulls a second time. So I I don't have many memories of. Yes, I think Kobe is pretty underrated in the in this GOAT debate. I mean, we've seen LeBron cratered in the finals. I think 2011 is one of those moments where he didn't rise to the occasion. And I believe that Kobe, for the most part, at least tried to take over games. And we saw LeBron really shade away from that. We value MJ for his killer mentality. And we value him being unafraid of the moment and being willing to take those shots and being okay with missing those shots. And we saw Kobe do the same. And I think if you're going to value that in MJ, we have to value that in Kobe as well. And I think one of the main differences between Kobe and LeBron is I think LeBron's like more physically dominant. He's 6'9", 270 or 260 or whatever. And Kobe's not that big, but I think Kobe could just take over a game mentally. He would just dominate guys mentally. And I don't think LeBron could do it in the same way. No disrespect to Le- LeBron. LeBron has all the scoring accolades. He's he pretty much outranks Kobe in almost all statistical like leaderboards. But I think, in my opinion, Kobe has an argument to be right up there with LeBron in this goat conversation. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, yeah. If I'm being totally honest, I really overlooked the impact that Kobe had on his generation during his career. You know, I was in a time where. You know, I was watching the NBA, but I wasn't like paying attention to him. He kind of just, I just felt like he was just trying to model MJ and was kind of cocky. And then when he passed away, just seeing, and obviously we overshare and, you know, social media can get kind of nauseating and people who aren't even Kobe fans kind of come out of the woodwork story. No offense. It's just true. Just to see (laughs) the impact of, of, of him. And like, I didn't realize that that, that was a lot of people's, that was their Jordan or that was their magic or that was their bird or that was their Durant, like whatever it is, that's who they followed and and lived and died for. So that was interesting to be totally honest. I don't know where to put him in the mix. Does he deserve to have a conversation for sure? Does he have his flaws? You bet. Um, Does he have some things that he does better than LeBron for sure? But not necessarily sure that he gets overlooked. It's just a weird time right now. I feel like everyone's just given LeBron a pass to that kind of second place status, depending on who you are and what your take is. Watching the thing with Jalen Rose the other day, he was just saying like, how come magic? Why all of a sudden has magic been passed? Right. right. So Great just, too. Yeah. It's, I think the fun part is that it leaves a point to argue, but the hard part is we're never going to get the answer. So I'm not sure if he's necessarily overlooked but maybe him passing early has made us realize just how special he actually was, if that makes sense. Right. No, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think him dying early kind of just adds to his mystique, right? It's kind of like... But I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about his skill set, right? Yeah. But that's the fun part about sports. And that's the fun part about all that is like, everyone's got their own opinion. And some people are going to watch MJ over this series and be like, well, LeBron's a way nicer person. And he does this. Okay, well, right. So it really is all about your own eye and what you're looking for. Um, But there's no doubt that Kobe had that cold blood and killer instinct inside of him. Jay, we know that you had uh, a few more questions and we're going to get to them later as well. We just don't want the mailbag to go on for too long. So we're going to move on to another listener, uh, Dante Trasolini, another former player, 2014 uh, provincial champ represent. He asked us quite a few questions as well, but we narrowed it down to two. One, one's a no-brainer, which we'll get to, and the other one is actually interesting. So John, him, he said him and his buddies sit around and argue, and it, it brings me a little bit of a sense of pride that there's still some younger-ish people out there sitting around their living rooms, not at this time, but when they can be together, arguing senseless things like, who's the better player, John Wall or Kyle Lowry? 
this is an interesting one. I was I kind of, when I read it, I said, wow. So I don't know, Corbs, do you want to answer first or you want me to take the lead on this? I think we can't uh, underplay John Wall's athleticism because he's been from out of the game for so long now. I think he played, last time he played was two years ago. I think we just tend to forget like how good he was, right? But I think I got to take Lowry here. I think he's just more physical. I think he just has a better basketball awareness and understanding and you can sag off john wall right john wall is not going to kill you if you sag off of him i don't know i think lowry's a good enough defender to oh my god uh, <laughs> I'm, taking john, I'm taking john wall a hundred out of a hundred times i'm oh. i don't really know what to say what? uh yeah without question i mean if if you're you're just we're also thinking about you're thinking you're throwing his injuries and you're over analyzing it pure talent that either of them have like John Wall is a way better basketball player than Kyle Lowry I'm sorry I oh this is I highly disagree with that I think Lowry's just a much better player overall better shooter I think he I think he's a better teammate I think he makes winning plays more often winning plays more often aka he takes charges you're gonna roll up that 30 second highlight reel of Kyle Lowry hitting game winners where are John Wall's game winners? Where's his iconic moments? Where was he? I didn't make the I didn't make the point. You did. I didn't say they had. Neither of them have iconic moments. One of them rode Kawhi Leonard's tails and played a great role, and did a great job. But if I'm in the draft and I have either player at the start of their careers, I'm taking John Wall. So there you go, Dante. Great question for you and your buddies. Apparently, there is no answer. Love to hear <laughs> everyone's uh, from that though. Next one, which is a no brainer, is. Uh, Mitch, a.k.a. me, versus Dante in one-on-one. Let me just say right off the bat, you got to respect your elders. I got old school game. And the only thing that I'm wondering is, if you're thinking, is it max dribbles? And what are we playing to? Because if we're playing to like five, then I'm beating you five nothing. Um, If we're playing to like 11, I'm going to get bored. I'm going to jack a couple threes. I'm going to try to like body you, give you some Hakeem Elijah one uh, post moves. Come on, man. It's not even close. It's even not close. 42 and out of shape. Yeah. Right, yeah. Corb? Yeah. The only way he's scoring is if you do the thing where you're playing like against your younger nephew and you just sack off him and he hits one or two shots. And you're like, oh, wow, good right. for you. You hit a couple shots. <laughs> Dante always says, you, we, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Uh, we don't answer stupid That's questions it. on this pod. I'm just sorry. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Well, uh, in my house, we don't use that word. I apologize. Okay. I better take that part. <laughs> I think on the website it says we are a non-swearing podcast, so that you're on the board of their corpse. That's round one of the mailbag. We probably dragged it on longer than we should have, but hey, it's all good. We appreciate people actually reaching out and asking questions. There's still a couple really good golden nugget questions that are waiting for us, and we plan on getting to the go those and answering them because they are very, very good. So thank you so much for the first ever mailbag. <laughs> We are super thrilled to finally talk to our first guest. Um, This gentleman is a good friend of mine. Um, He's someone who uh, I have played basketball with, who I've coached with, uh, who I currently work with, and and is uh, is one of my best friends. So we are super thrilled to have uh, Dom Zimmerman on the show tonight. And uh, we just, you know, have Dom tell his story, get to know, you know, what basketball meant to him and and why he was so involved in it, because he has a huge resume. And I think that's one of the cool things about our podcast is there's so many hoopers out there. There's so many coaches out there that have a story and just haven't been able to share that. And, And this is the reason we're doing it. So Dom, welcome to the show tonight. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Mitchie. Corbs, uh, yeah, feel honored to be part of this, to be your first guest as well. So when this thing, when this thing blows up a couple of years from now, and you'll have thousands and thousands of followers, I can always say I was your first <laughs> guest. Um, no, this is this is uh, this is your gift, you know. I think about our friendship. Got all the warm and fuzzies when you mentioned, you know, one of your best friends. I would I would reciprocate that comment. You know, Mitch, you're one of my best friends, and you know we've gone through a lot, highs and lows, and. This is this is one of your gifts, being able to talk to people and connect with people and make people laugh. And I'm truly honored to be part of this with uh, with you and Corbin. 
No worries, man. Thanks. Just let you know that the podcast is about you, not me. So yeah. <laughs> you can, you can, yeah. you can yeah. stop with the fluffy stuff. I was also thinking too, I was thinking like I was 17 when I went to Cap College. So I've known you for like 25 years of my life. 25 years. That's, a, that's a decent little chunk of time, right? Quarter of a century, man. That's a long time. Yeah. And I'm sitting here just looking at your resume and, you know, what you've been through basketball wise. And I just, let's just jump right into it here. Tell me about, you know, a young Dom Zimmerman living in, in Burnaby and obviously an active guy. I love sports. Like what was it about basketball? When did you kind of, when did the hook get into your mouth and, and when did you really start to know that this was something that you wanted to pursue and, and why did that happen? Absolutely. Um, so I think for me, you know, like you said, I was pretty active. My, my mom and dad were, were hugely supportive of my brother and I, Dennis. My brother Dennis was three years older than me and always gave us opportunities to uh, participate in soccer, football, track and field, those kinds of things. And uh, I think I truly got hooked when I was in grade six or seven and my brother was uh, attending St. Thomas More. I was at St. Mary's in Vancouver. And his team in grade 10, they won the BC Provincial Championship at Maple Ridge. And I will never, ever forget that year. Brother Short, our old principal at St. Thomas More, was a coach full of some interesting characters. Uh, Darren McCormick, Stu Andrade, some, some STMC alumni. And I just remember watching my brother play and them win, you know, the biggest championship you could at the high school level in grade 10 in the whole province. And that really, really hooked me. I just started making it a habit and it became therapeutic for me. You know, I, I would set goals in my mind and... I was able to attend St. Thomas More. I quit all the other sports. I kept doing soccer and, and track and field in high school and sort of curtailed those in about grade nine or 10. Jumped into football in grade 12, which was an awesome experience, uh, but just really fell in love with it in high school, but really sparked by my brother's, you know, my brother's team success uh, in about, I think it was 1988. Played in high school at St. Thomas More under some awesome coaches, Lou Delorier, Joe Thierman, uh, made some great friends, but just sort of always had goals in my mind of trying out for other teams, you know, provincial teams. And I was uh, lucky enough and worked hard enough to make the U16 and U17 provincial teams. Graduated from high school in 93, you know, kept going. I, I didn't write goals down per se, but I, I definitely had goals in my mind. And I would visualize as I was practicing, as I was putting up jumpers or dribbling, I would always visualize where I would be a year later or six months later or two years later. And I visualized college and I, I ended up going to I really wanted to go to SFU. Jay Triano at the time was a coach, and he um, he had recruited me to play football and basketball, and I was very excited to go there. And, and then he broke my heart. They had recruited some some older guys, and anyway, that route didn't work. Uh, so I ended up going to Capilano College. Played under an awesome coach, Phil Langley, who was an assistant national team coach, very knowledgeable guy. Got to play with with you eventually. Uh, played with you know Gerald Cole and Brad Cote, Chris Reimer, those likes, and and just really enjoyed my time there kept getting better and kept working on it. Then I, I went through a bit of a rut after my, I played three years at Capilano College. I love my time with you and Jason Mahar. I can remember, you know, my first memories of, of you were, uh, were interesting because you were so talented, but I wanted you to work harder. And I remember working out after practice and, and uh, trying to get you to work out with me. And I don't know if you remember that, but you, uh, you didn't. <laughs> you wouldn't uh, <laughs> you, you wouldn't hit the gym with me and it, it bothered me because I thought you could be so good anyway we can maybe talk about that later but after uh Capilano College I uh, I took a year off you and I, fired at the host <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah you you know it was interesting because you I, I just felt like I was I was working harder than you and I felt like you could have been at that time, I thought you could have, you know, done a little bit more and you were so talented. And I'm so happy that later you did. I know this shows up this, this episode is about me, but second with you for the record, I love, uh, I love, uh, yeah, I was a second I love, star only, only. Yeah. Okay. Just, just throwing that out there. It just feels nice. It feels nice. Mm -hmm. no one being now, <laughs> I, love, anyway. I love how you eventually turned it around. And, uh, and then I, and then I was kind of at a bit of a crossroads. I didn't know if I still wanted to play. Um, I took a year off of playing. Okay, let's stop there. Dude, we were trying to just talk about how you got hooked into basketball. Man. <laughs> Obviously, you were someone who was super active. Like, how disappointed was your dad when he de you decided that soccer was no longer going to be for you? He was good, man. He was yeah. cool. Yeah, Hor Horst. A lot of, I don't know. My friends know. My, my dad, Horst, is, uh, he has the yeah. ultimate work ethic and he just always loved and supported and he still does. So he was cool, man. He knew, he knew where my passions, you know, were and, and he mm -hmm. was okay with that. He never pushed me to do anything. And, 
he was always supportive and, you know, one of my, you know, my number one fan and no, that was cool. He, and he saw my passion for basketball, right? He mm-hmm. saw, he saw the time and energy that I, that I put into it at that time. And, and that awesome. was cool. That was cool with him. Yeah. Let's go back a little bit too, is like, um, as I get older, you know, when I was a kid, much like you, the high school championships and seeing the Andrew Steinfelds and seeing the Ron Putsies and seeing those guys and being like, those guys are who I want to be. And they, they were only two or three years older, four years older than me. They were like my heroes, right? And you touched on that a little bit about your brother and like, like Man, you yeah, know, really. Darren McCormick and things like that. So just talk about like, what was it about seeing those guys and what was it about like being a part of those moments that just got you excited? Was it like, did you look up to them? Like, what, you know, all the little things that I think I, that's my fear as a coach is I don't, are our kids spending time looking at those high school guys mm-hmm. and going like, that's who mm-hmm. I want to be? Or are they yeah. just on Instagram and worrying about like their triple step back with 15 dribbles? And- no, absolutely. And I don't even know how to, you know, I don't, I don't know the word, where to go with this answer other than it's, it's obviously different, right? It's different now um, and not better or worse. Uh, but yeah, I just, I remember, I remember all those things. I remember the Agrodome. I remember watching my brother's team who had won the title in grade 10, uh, that team playing in the semifinals against Richmond High. On the other side, it was North Delta and Chad Johnson and Mitch Berger. And, you know, we were in the semifinals oh, yeah. of the Triple yeah. A's, which was the highest level. And there was, you know, no word of a lie, five, 6,000 people in the Agrodome, maybe more. I remember watching that and obviously formulating goals in my mind, right? I wanted to be there. I wanted to, I wanted to be on that court, you know, with my St. Thomas More teammates. Absolutely. So just visualizing all those, just, you know, the looking up to and seeing these men play and, you know, cheering on my brother who I, you know, love dearly and, and uh, just with passion and then watching the Richmond Colts, you know, beat us like 120 to 65 or whatever it was it was just crazy right but just to get to that point at that time was really cool for a small all boys school yeah and then it just i guess it just i guess ultimately what it did was it put pictures in my head right it just gave me gave me things to look to and 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 aspire to visually as goals right obviously you really at a young age was that something that your dad put into you was goal setting or is it something that just naturally came to you like I remember as a kid sitting down and my dad talking to me about goals and and and, and walking me through the process of doing them but you obviously have had them in your thoughts and on paper for a long time is that something that was you or was it just a family I, I don't recall ever learning it I just yeah. I, I don't know if it's intrinsic um it's mm-hmm. funny because my wife Lisa she always says oh Cicely our little one we have a little two and a half year old daughter Cicely's just like you and I, I'm like what do you mean she's like well she's just driven she she doesn't give up she's really you know she wants to complete things and so that so I don't know if it's just innate in me which is awesome uh but mm-hmm. it can also be you know you can you can really stress out about certain things as well that way. But I think it was sort of innate. I don't remember. I, I remember having conversations with a good friend, Gerald Cole, uh, one of my best friends who, who, you know, we grew up in, in basketball together and he would write his, he, he would write his goals down. Yeah. Right. He yeah. would. And uh, maybe my conversations with him and then we became friends and we were both hoopers. So we kind of did things together. Mm-hmm. Right. But I don't, I don't know when it, when it went click. Yeah. I, maybe yeah. it was just, some people, have that drive and others don't i'm not sure right yeah yeah and then it, also interesting too is when you think about your journey of like we're at ubc right now and we're talking about it's like your two of the three years at capilano right and in high school and then even at ubc you were voted a captain but you were never the you were never the leading scorer on your team you might have been maybe yeah. close in assists you were you weren't the rebounder like you just were I was a boring basketball player, straight up. Like, no, and you're, and it's so true. No, it's interesting because I thought about this, right? Like, I, I, as you reflect on your career and your life, and I was able to turn it into a job as a professional athlete. You, you reflect on things, and you make so many friends and connections, and you talk about the old days. And, and I was really boring. I was a really boring pass first player. You know, I didn't, I didn't shoot the ball a lot. I felt like the more it was interesting because when I, especially when I played pro in Germany, mm-hmm. the more I shot, the worse we would do. Like statistically, the more I shot, the worse we would do. So if I scored four points, we would win by 10 plus. If I scored 19 or 17 points, we would like lose in overtime or we would lose by 10 or whatever it was. Right. So there was a direct correlation between me not shooting the ball in our school and our, and our team success. Yeah. I knew I could defend. I knew I would always be, you know, one of the fittest or, you know, 
in shape, best in shape players on my team just because I prepared myself right. and I was reliable and I, I knew I could lock down guards, right? I felt like that was one of my strengths. Um, but I was boring. Like I didn't take chances. You yeah. know, I was really, yeah. really, really, you know, slow it down, push maybe, but don't make that risky pass, take care of the ball, set up the offense, make sure our guys in the right spots. That was my strength, which eventually landed me a a pro job. Right. So I realized what my strengths were. Eventually I wasn't flat in high school. Maybe I, you know, I I could shoot it or I could score at that level because it was much easier. Right. Right. But after that, like you said, you know, cap college, UBC pro, no, I wasn't a scorer at all. Right. Just uh, interesting that you touched um, not making the risk. Cause like i definitely seen you play blackjack before and <laughs> I, can, I can fully relate to i'm uh, happy to walk away with 40 dollars basketball to real life. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had a few we've had a few conversations in casinos you and i but i think i think that's a i think that's a huge thing for people that are listening to like tune into uh, you know in sport we just assume that teammates and coaches are going to just gravitate towards the person that maybe is the accolade or the whatever and you know 5 years of your career uh, I'm not sure about pro which we'll talk about but you know you were selected to be a captain on your team and what do you think it was what were the things that were inside of you what were the things that were taught to you at a young age that you carried um, to the next levels that made you kind of captain worthy, if that makes sense. Like, what what was it? Obviously, you've touched on one thing too. You know, I was a young high school punk, pretty full of myself. Thought I was pretty sweet and didn't think I had to work too hard, even though I still was a second team all star. But you had this drive inside of you. You had this drive inside of you, like so. Mitchie, that's an awesome question, and we're you know we. It's humbling, right, to reflect on that. And I think that, I think what it was, my mom and dad and my brother, the four of us, we, I was always taught from a young age to say please and say thank you and be respectful and be honorable and ethical and all those kinds of things, right? All these beautiful principles that my mom and dad taught me at a young age. I think those carried out and they allowed me to be encouraging of others and maybe not jealous of others and maybe just, you know, a positive person, you know, like not, not dwelling on negatives, but being positive. And I think I, I played like that too. Right. So it allowed me in a tryout or on the court with my teammates to be constantly be supportive. You know, a guy like you look at a guy like Steve Nash and the beautiful, and I don't care about his MVPs. The beautiful thing about Steve Nash is that, he high fives his teammates over and over and not just his teammates, his, his equipment manager, his head assistant coach. Like that's all that is, is just gratitude, encouragement, positivity. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, and I, and I tried to, to be encouraging of my teammates. And, and that was just something again, that was taught to me at a very young age. And I guess it made me, you know, not the best score on a team, but made me captain worthy. If that makes you know any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I just, I also wanted to mention, as you were saying that I was connecting to, you know, as we coach, I mean, Corbin, you're, you're an aspiring young coach who just loves the game. And Mitch, you're, you know, you are one of the best coaches in the province. Is that the third time I've, I've complimented you? Um, <laughs> no, I think that's the first. That's okay. Um, so, so you, uh, I love the beard game too. Mitch, you keep the short beard. I like it. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I think it, what makes you one of the best coaches in the province and Corbin, you, uh, you a really good young coach is that we don't, we can't highlight the top scorers. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's really important. I think that in our program at St. Thomas more, we do a good job of valuing each player from one to 12 to equipment manager to assist. You follow me. So like just making everybody feel valuable, you know, and I just think so many young players nowadays are looking at, Oh, you know, who scored 20 points or who dunked on who or who crossed over who it's, it's not that whole making everybody equal because everybody's just as important to the team from the manager to the 12th guy, to the ninth guy, to the top scorer, to the top rebounder, to the, you fall just so making everybody equal. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's an important part of what good coaches do and what captains do essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you said gratitude, encouragement, and positivity. And you think about like, and this is kind of the purpose of this podcast is to be like, you know, in the, in the intro talk, I talked about the first episode was, that basketball is kind of like, you know, many people have said it, it's a metaphor. So when you think about gratitude, encouragement, positivity, think about the times that we're in right now. If you have a sense of you're in COVID-19 and you're stuck in your house, if you have a sense of gratitude, encouragement, and positivity with your family and your friends and the people that you're allowed to be around, like think about how far that would take you. And I that, that's kind of one of the home run hits, I think, is that all that stuff for you that you've taken from basketball 
you're still applying to your life right now. So that's super cool. And those are just three powerful terms. And like, you know, in our program, we're always trying to find keywords and phrases. And, and, and when you think about that, that's, that's pretty awesome stuff. So obviously, you know, you finish at UBC um, and then you all of a sudden are like, wow, I'm going to get paid to play basketball. So what's the difference there? How does that work? Like what, what changes at practice? What changes in your, you know, your preparation, the time that you have, like what give people, because I didn't play pro. I have never, that's something that's not, you know, familiar to me and probably a lot of our listeners. So what, what changes there when you decide to go, all right, I'm going to give this a run. I've got my passport and I'm going to go over to, you know, Germany and play. Yeah, lo- lo- lots of changes. Uh, I'm going to try to be short here as possible, but everything's faster. You know, yeah. little things like a guy like I had great conversations with a pro like Eric Butler, who I played with at UBC or just we just missed each other at UBC. But just things are faster. Things are quicker. Diet. You got to take care of your body. Uh, you can't ski. You can't snowboard. You can't water ski. All those kinds of things. So just little things like that were in my contract that I couldn't do, you know, at risk of injuring yourself. That was definitely a, a, a wake up to me. Jumping into Germany, uh, I, I played in the Bundesliga. So I, I, I signed with a team called BBC Bayreuth at the time. I tried out with three teams and uh, and I ended up, I got, well, I tried out with five teams. I got three offers and I ended up um, signing with this club by right, who had just been in the first league in the top league in Germany and went bankrupt. So they had to drop down three leagues down to the third league. We had about five pros on our team and then a few students who were getting paid a little bit. And uh, I realized right away, you know, we were in the third league and everybody in that town wanted us back in the first league really, really quick. And that city really wanted us, wanted us back in the first league really quick. And the change for me was that I realized I wasn't playing for a university or a college or a high school anymore. I was getting paid. So if I played poorly, the fans could boo. If I played poorly, I could go to a restaurant and someone at the next table could come up to me and tell me that I played terribly, you know, or you're not worth the money they're paying you or whatever it was. So, or in the news, in the in the in the you know newspaper on the radio, they could say, oh, you know, Dom McZerman was just ter- he was atrocious. He, you know, so it was just it, realizing that this was my job. That was a huge wake up call for sure. Not you know, whereas at UBC, everything's pretty positive for the most part, right? Anything that's written about you is is either positive or nothing said. So that that was a huge huge difference as well. Um, and just taking care of your body, not putting <laughs> bad foods in your body and taking care of it. And, and as a captain, it was interesting dealing with management and the head coach and the president. And we would, uh, I can remember my second or third year when we were, uh, you know, you lose three, four or five games in a row and you're supposed to get paid at the first of the month and all of a sudden you don't get paid. And mm-hmm. then I got, I got the Americans on my team coming to me cause I'm the captain saying, Hey Zimmerman, what's up? You know, why aren't we getting paid? Then it's the fourth, fifth, sixth of the month. We still haven't got paid. Oh, we lost another game. We lost five in a row. Still not getting paid. So then it's like, okay, I'm the captain of this team. I got my, my teammates are telling me, hey, let's not practice today. We can't, we're not going to go to practice. So just, yeah. you know, learning to deal with management and coaches. And luckily I had, I had wonderful people around me. It was a perfect fit for me that the club that I started playing for, I ended up playing with them for seven years. It, it was really ideal in that I fit in. Like you mentioned, I had a passport. I wasn't good enough to play overseas. If I was a, a an import player, I was luckily I had a German passport. So so I was able to speak the language, which was a huge advantage for me. I could speak German and English, and um, and that helped as well in those situations. Yeah, interesting too that you get all the way over there, but obviously a place that you've been many times. But the thing that comes back is not your skill set basketball wise; it's your skill set people wise that helps thrive and get people through things. And like you're a captain, so you're just going back to those all those goals that you've set all the things that you challenge yourself to do throughout your entire life, the the things your dad has tried to, you know, make you do to become a better man and everything that you've learned in your time. And then you're just using that toolkit as opposed to even just your basketball skills, you're managing people, right. Which is super Mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have like one kind of funny story or like something wild? Was there a wild game that you were a part of? Did you see some dudes on your team just go bananas? We don't have to name names. Is there something that, sticks out that if you were sitting around a fire pit with some buddies and someone asked you a story you know that's a tough one Mitchie I I I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now no just like meeting amazing human beings from all over the world 
you know, mainly our imports were, were American. So just a real gamut of different, you know, personalities and, and ridiculous athletes who, you know, you try to meld with Germans and Russians and Czech, Czech players and French players. Uh, that was always, that was always fun, but uh, the story will come to me probably in a couple hours. I can't think of anything at the moment. Did they smoke in the arena or was that already? Oh yeah. 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 They smoked in the arenas. Yeah. Really? I'm sure. They had areas. They definitely had areas where we were. Yeah. So they, uh, yeah. The fan clubs would, yeah. would bang on their drums and dart away. They that were, uh, yeah, yeah. We had fan, we had a fan bus and, and they were, the fans were great. They were wonderful mm-hmm. working, you know, working class people who just love connecting with, with, with the players for sure. Yeah. I remember a uh, buddy who, Obviously, Tony, you played pro a lot, and the one McCur- of the first McCurry. yeah, that yeah, yeah. stood out to him was like the first time he forced his guy baseline and maybe didn't cut him off, and he realized that there was no help, and it was like <laughs> you're on your own, man. Like we're all, <laughs> thing, bro, we're all learning a paycheck right here. So sorry, bro. <laughs> like, just yeah, to- yeah, yeah, and the, and the and the different levels of coaches too, right? Like I, I was lucky. My first four years, I had a guy named George Kempf, and he was. He was a uh, an ex. I didn't know, but he was an ex player. He was like the seventh leading scorer all time in Germany, and he was just he was crazy. He was absolutely crazy. He got us as fit as a team could ever be. Like he would make our bigs puke and run these ridiculous hour long, you know, preseason runs. And and if we lost and we played poorly, he literally would not talk to us until the Wednesday practice. So he wouldn't talk to us. So he would just run practice. If we played on a Saturday, we'd have conditioning Sunday. If we lost on Saturday and we maybe should have won that game or we played poorly, the guy would not talk. Only the assistant coach would talk to us. He would just come into practice. He'd tell, he'd kind of point at his assistant coach, whisper to his, our assistant coach. Our assistant coach would get us to do things, and he wouldn't talk to us. We'd practice Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He wouldn't actually talk to us until Wednesday. So we were like, this dude's crazy, man. Like, what is wrong with him? He, he, we, were, we were extremely successful with him because he just, you know, he held us to such a high standard, right? Um, you know, didn't. So survive like that within the team? Like, when you have a coach like that, is it kind of like F it, this guy? Or it's is it pretty like, bipolar, man. It's pretty bipolar. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's, uh, it's high and low, right? Like it's when we win, he's like, he's like a little kid in a candy store. He's happy. But when we lost, it was, and he would have side conversations with me as the captain. So he'd maybe talk to me a little bit and try to pass messages on, but just an interesting cat and very successful as a player and very successful as a coach. Um, but just really, and we were efficient when we were on the court, we ended up going uh, 19 and one or 19 and two, our first year got promoted. We, we lost our first game. We won 19 in a row and lost our second, got promoted to the second league and then had him in the second league in the second Bundesliga for five years until he, he, uh, he went to a different club. But I don't know to answer your question. What is it like? It's weird, man. <laughs> when your coach doesn't talk to you from Sunday to Wednesday, it's like, okay, right. you are, we, we worked hard for him. Like, you know, it made us think mm-hmm. about how we performed and that's why we won the most, most of our games. Right. So it was a bit of an odd relationship, but he was successful. As you move forward, that's that's super interesting just to hear the difference, right? And how, and obviously, you know, the elements that we're overlooking to are just like how a European and German coach would handle a situation as opposed to a Canadian or a American or an Italian, you know what I mean? Like yeah. just the different yeah, yeah. elements that all are involved and just, that's pretty cool to hear. Just, <laughs> I can say that I've done a lot of things that I regret, but I've never not talked to our guys. for No, no, you're pretty communicative, Mitchell, as a coach. Yeah. Cool. And then, you know, humble brag, you go on and, you, you know, you get your jersey retired by your club and tell, just talk a little bit about that. And have you given yourself the time to reflect on that? Or is it just, have you just let that pass? Or what, what are those emotions? Like, have you ever thought about your whole entire basketball career? Yeah. Yeah. Your, like what what's that feeling like pretty it's pretty amazing it was really cool i mean i you know i went from canada to germany uh to a completely different city didn't know anybody we had a few family members and relatives like sort of 100 200 kilometers away from where i was but i had to start new and start fresh and it was a seven year journey for me in germany that was a process of everything I learned from everybody else, right? Like the Bruce ends is at UBC, the Richie chambers, you know, who you were coached by. I was honored to be coached by him as well at, at, at UBC. Um, you know, all the lessons I learned from all these wonderful people kind of culminated in that, in that moment, but no one was there, you know, like it was, it was just, uh, you know, none of my boys were there. 
you know, you, you weren't part of it and my other friends. So it was, it was different. It was like, I was living this other life, but yeah, to reflect on it, it was, it was awesome. It was spectacular. It just affirmed that I, you know, clearly I had an impact with this club and it was, it was a positive one and I was proud of it. You know, you mentioned humble. I, I, I hope I'm a humble person, so it's not something I share with a lot of people, but it was an amazing accomplishment to see your, your jersey, you know, your number retired and put up in the rafters during my last game. Lots of tears, lots of emotion, uh, but really, again, gratitude. And then, you know, on to the next step, right? Like, what's next? You know, what, what, are, my, what are my next goals? You know, what am I going to do back home in Vancouver? I had all those things processing in my mind, you know, sort of long before I made the decision to hang them up. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you. And and I think, again, not to, we're just getting off the ground here, but that's kind of what it's about is like, I, I don't know if you've listened or you, you said you did listen. to. The I first did. Episode. Yeah, I did. We're just terrible at talking about ourselves because there's that element of we're worried that people are going to think that we're bragging. And I, and I think this is a platform where you've probably met so many people and so many, there's probably kids that we've taught or you've coached or, Hoopers that have met you at Dolphin Park hanging out, and they've had no idea about this extended journey. Like, oh, yeah, that's Dom. You played at CAB, UBC, teaches STM. Like, they would have no idea of the extent of how far it went for you, right? And yeah. kind of the goal is to, like, just not not in a way to to brag about it. It's just like, hey, we all have a story, and here's what's happened. And, mm. and then fast forward to, to now where we are, and like you say, so your career ends, and some ups and downs and what, what did you take um, from basketball and how did you apply that to your life? You know, we've obviously shared a lot of things together, you know, as friends and colleagues, right. We were in the same master's program. You're a year ahead of me. What did you use? Like, how did, how did you use your skills from basketball and the things that it taught you to apply you to becoming, yeah. uh, um, you know, what are you like 12, 13 years teaching, you're the director of alumni at our school, you know, you have different leadership roles. You're also a teacher. What, what did you take from your coaches? Long question, but yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I think work ethic, just getting your hands dirty, right? Like I, I knew I had to work really, really hard to attain success in a sport like basketball because I wasn't six, eight and gifted athletically. I had to work really hard. I think working with others, you know, I, I learned how to, You know, you learn the psychology of people and giving and taking and listening and pushing and taking a lead and then stepping back and stepping back and following at the right time. So just learning those things, Uh, building teams, building teamwork. You know, I'm I'm blessed to work at a wonderful place like St. Thomas More with you and and some awesome people. You know, I'm challenged by a new role as a director of alumni. So just building teams and, you know, a board there, a structured, you know, nonprofit society now and. Just building, empowering others, you know, just like on the court when you, you know, when you got your top scorer who one needs the ball, you know, you got to get that player the ball at the right time. You got to make them feel good and get in a zone and get in a rhythm and in a rhythm. And, and it's the same in life, right? Like just listening to people and talking at the right times and being a good friend and just so many things, just teamwork, you know, all these sort of cliche words that we use in sports. But when you go through the battle with, with grown men and a group of human beings, um, you learn so much about yourself and how you how you deal with adversity and how you deal with loss, how you stay calm in victory, right? Like just being chill and understanding, like being humble as you are victorious in anything in life, right? Uh, being compassionate, the, all those kinds of things. So it's an awesome question. The point, like your purpose pod, I listened to it just to just to just to go back to you know the reason why you're having this podcast is awesome. Like I I think it's spectacular when I think about the people, the basketball people in our community who will be on this show eventually. I can't wait to hear their stories. You know, I, I think I know a number of them, but I don't know them maybe that you know that that intensely and that intimately. And I can't wait to hear their stories. I think you guys are. It's a cool. It's a you know who doesn't want to talk about themselves but in a humble way. And I think this is a great, great outlet for that to happen for sure. Cool. Awesome answer. Good stuff. Uh, we're going to just uh, fire. We've got to do a little bit of rapid fire here at you just to put you on your heels. Um, I got to give a show. I got to give a shout out to my freak show club though. That's probably the most important team I've ever played on. How do you not know that that's not going to be one of the ah, questions? Okay. Okay. I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I'll edit that part out. Don't worry. <laughs> Still awake. That's good. Uh, okay. Oh. I'm learning a lot about you, buddy. 
Okay, so we're going to go rapid fire at you. You know, first thing that kind of comes on the top of your head here, whatever you think is appropriate. What's the greatest chip out there? You got one bag World of chips. Cups. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you meant like <laughs> World Cup of soccer. Uh, I'm just going to go Doritos, straight Doritos. Which which kind? Wow. Cheese, uh, just the regular. Not zesty, too, much, cheese. too much. Just the regular. The red bag. Yes, sir. The red bag. I feel like I prodded you in an answer, but that's a great answer. Too, Not, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's spinning? On, what's spinning on your Spotify or your iTunes right now? Mm. That you're, you're bump, uh, bumping that you're feeling, or other than Coldplay and David Gray, uh, from a hip hop standpoint, mm. I love my I love my trap called Quest. Uh, Logic, you know, thanks to you, I got into Logic. I like Drake. I like Drake. A little bit of Mac Miller. A little bit of Mac Miller. This evening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for joining us that's your that's your teenage son influencing you absolutely one of the questions we have yeah. is like ketchup on macaroni but i have never seen anyone in my entire life put ketchup well, apparently on so it, so kyle turris is all about ketchup on the macaroni um shout out, shout out kyle turris shout out KT. can't wait to see you in the playoffs i hope it's getting controversial though, like because Corbin said mums or whatever homemade mac and cheese, no, but craft dinner is acceptable. Like, come on, you just what? Where are we at? Hey, I mean, but I, I'm into, hey, I'm into I love restaurants. I've been to restaurants with you. I've seen you. Oh, ask. I love my ketchup. I love my ketchup, but not on not on mac and cheese. Not on no way. Okay, yeah, no, no on steak. No. Ketchup on steak. Uh, it depends. If it's a tenderloin, no. If it's like a cheaper cut, perhaps. This is where we'll give a little plug to uh, Choffee's. Choffee's meat market in Delhi, Reno. Oh, Choffee, my brother-in-law. If Corbs, did you hear that? He he will actually put ketchup on a steak. That is. So I just, uh, wow. I, if it's, ooh, if it's a cheap sad, cut, if it's a cheap cut of of steak, maybe. I mean, tenderloin, nice like medium rare tenderloin. No way, no way, no way. Your favorite basketball player growing up was. Detlef Shrimp. <laughs> that was ridiculous. I was not expecting that answer. Death, the threat. The German Wunderkind. Oh um, my god. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, hey, I'm I'm joking. I'm trying to be funny. Um, but well, you got us both to laugh. Yeah, I mean, this whole Jordan documentary. This is ridiculous. It's like it's what we need right now. And just watching Jordan. I mean, Jordan was unreal. I just, you know, he is undoubtedly the greatest ever six out of six and majestic in the air and just watching them you know i don't know i, I love gary payton i love sean camp i like the sonics because you know we got him on tv all the time and debt the threat was on the sonics man debt of strength my number one player love it love it wow i respect that Detlef Shrimp. You like a Detlef with a little mixture of X Man. You got a little X <laughs> kind of like prick sort of like yeah, I'll throw some elbows and I'll do what I gotta yeah. do to survive here. I like that. I like that. When you have Andrew when you have Andrew Mavis on the show, you uh, you ask him about that one time we met in high school, he'll tell you a little about my little my tricks on the court. Well, it's funny too, uh, after I played against Andrew Mavis in high school, I couldn't eat for about a day and a half. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure he could tell you about his tricks too. If, if you could do it all again, you would. Oh my goodness. Is there a pass button? Cause I love that question so much. If I could do it all over again, I would so take, can... take more chances. Oh, that's so vague, but. <laughs> this guy's been on here for 39 minutes. And 40 tough... minutes. I know been... that's a tough question. That's a really good question. Can you ask me one more time? I'll come up with an answer really quick. If you could do it all again, you would work a little bit harder. Why? Because I mean, pertaining to basketball, I feel like I could have done more to at the time when it became a job, you're making X amount of dollars and that's not what it's all about, but it's your job. I feel like I could have, you know, made more money playing professional basketball and it was still a job and it was great. I got paid enough and it was awesome. But, if I could have done it all over again, I would have worked a lot harder and hmm. I would have been more successful as a professional athlete. Interesting. Good. Thanks for that answer. Uh, that's awesome insight, Dom. Thank you so much. Um, one more thing to chat with and thank you for taking the time to be with us. We really, really appreciate it. We know you have that, you know, a couple little ones and things going on. You're an online teacher these days, but, uh, 
if we were to ask Dom Zimmerman, you know, where does he want to be in 10 years? What does that look like? What, you know, what does he want to be doing? That's going to make sure that he's happy. I want to be, continue to be a a solid dad, a a solid husband, (laughs) you know, 10 years from now, I want to be able to watch my kids play sports and support them and, and, you know, have fun with my wife and travel, travel the world if we can. I want to be healthy, obviously. Uh, I want to try to stay fit as well. I mean, those are, those are, those are my impulse answers off the bat. That's great. No, it's good. It's good to put people on the spot sometimes. Cause you usually, sometimes you get something that's way out there, but sometimes you get something that's really on the, you know, from the heart. So before we let you go tonight, is there anything else you'd like to add? Any shout outs for the people or well, uh, um, yeah. any thoughts before, uh, before you're done with us? Just quick quick shout out to my freak the best basketball team i've ever played on is the freak show men's league team um but we're more than a men's league we're actually a movement we are it's called freak show nation corbin stop laughing man this thing's real freak show has a, freak show has uh has seven soon to be nine hall of fame members uh the freak show is a originally a men's league basketball team led by none other than matt matt anthony matthew anthony otherwise known as pud uh he is our president and ceo <laughs> He is in the Hall of Fame along with Matt Finn and Andrew Mavis, Jason Bristow, Kevin Keeler, old UBC teammates, uh, and Andy Latchford and myself. I'm also in the, I'm actually wearing my Hall of Fame blazer right now. You can't see me, but I wear it on on uh, Thursday nights. Um, and then Can you send a picture of that, please. I will. And uh, JP Reimer and Downtown Freddie Brown are the next uh, people that have been inaugurated, will be inaugurated into our Hall of Fame. So, all you young ballers, is that uh, is that uh like first time release information or is that it, no it's known it's public yeah it was released through the associated press uh you obviously missed that tweet i did uh, I'm sorry. how many times are you guys like capilano men's league champions i can't even count I, you'd have to ask kevin when kevin keeler's on the show you'll have to ask him i think it's seven nine ten eleven fourteen i don't know but it's multiple championships yeah, there's no doubt that going forward, you will not be the first or last Freak Show member to be uh, interviewed. On yes, sir. Yes, sir. And hey, I just want to close by saying, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I love what you guys are doing. I uh, can't wait to hear what's next. Corbs, love seeing you, love talking to you. And Mitchie, this is your gift, man. Talking to people, connecting with people and uh, letting them tell stories, making people laugh. This is right up your alley. This thing's going to blow up. Thanks, man. We we hope so. We're, we were thrilled that, you know, when we talked about, we're trying to have, we have a bit of a plan and a format here. When we thought about who we wanted to be our first guest, we were humbled and honored to have you on. Um, we think you're someone who has a voice for the people that, I don't, I don't want to say looked over because that sounds disrespectful, but just the people who put their head down, made themselves a nice little career, carved, carved a good life for themselves, and now are finding themselves in successful um, life situations, whether it be with work, family, or friends. And I think you're an example and a mentor to many people. And I think that your important story, your story is very important. A lot of people that are listening can take a few things away. I think there are some powerful words and some really important things that were uh, said tonight, uh, besides the fact of you trying to call me out, but that's okay. I have the mic and I always get the last word. Um, but we love you and we appreciate you and we're, we're humbled and honored to have you on as our Thank first you. guest. So, yeah. Hey, shout, shout out, shout out Johnny Dumont. You know, I feel his presence all the time. Uh, he is a, uh, he's a warrior in the uh, basketball world and obviously uh, he was a good friend of, of you and myself. So shout out Johnny Dumont. Love JD. For sure. There's one guy that we would, you know, if I could uh, crack fat tug with and sit down and do this podcast with he'd be at the top of my list for sure so lots of love man thanks for being with us uh thanks for listening everyone we're looking forward to what your thoughts are again send us an email at hoopsjourney at gmail.com dm us on instagram let us know get in the mailbag any questions you have corbs any thoughts um no no, Good. Just no glad you're awake over there, bro. Edit your edit your butt off. All right. Episode one. Thanks a lot. <laughs>